Hey everyone, back again. Just quickly, I promise, I said I'd only have two lectures and now we're going into the third, uh, but I've got these 15 minute windows to work with and sometimes I have to rush and that one was just too rushed uh, to really get everything across. But I've got another 15 minutes here, I promise I won't take all of it. Um, let me just rewind uh, to King Leopold II uh, of Belgium. If you watched in the second lecture, I mentioned that really kind of the first um, one of our uh, European leaders to experiment with colonization in Africa uh, was Leopold II. Not totally true. The French had um, practiced colonialism in what is now Algeria, northern Africa, uh, as early as 1830. Um, however, Leopold II is the first to really kind of utilize the industrial war machine uh, of Africa to sail up rivers uh, and to conquer large sections uh, of what is now um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, for Belgium, this tiny little nation uh, in northern Europe. And like I mentioned, the reason he did so is he was particularly interested in the production of rubber, a very important industrial um, uh, raw material that could be found in abundance in uh, the jungles of Africa. And he imposed a really strict rule uh, on the Congolese in order to get these kind of quotas uh, of rubber he was interested in producing. If you see these images here of Africans missing limbs, uh, a common practice that would be uh, enforced by um, both uh, agents of different corporations, Belgian corporations, and also uh, colonial officials related to the government, um, would they they'd take limbs of people who didn't meet the quotas of what they were supposed to as a warning uh, for other Africans about how uh, to properly meet um, the Belgian demands. And like I said, modern historians uh, believe that somewhere between 1 million and 15 million, now that's a, you know, it's a huge group of, a huge number, but proper records weren't really kept uh, in order to figure it out. But modern historians believe that the number of Africans who were killed uh, during Belgian rule is somewhere in the millions. Uh, and that's a, you know, a massive number. And remember, this is after the Atlantic slave trade. Um, so a lot of people like to say, you know, when the abolition of the slave trade happened, beginning with Britain in the 1830s, extended to the United States and all these other things. Um, when the abolition of slavery occurred, you know, the, the horrors in Africa were kind of over and that's not, that's not true at all. In fact, they were ramped up as uh, the Europeans went into Africa. And for those of you who are literature fans, I, I can't emphasize it. a short novella that's really fantastic, Joseph Conrad's the Heart of Darkness, which is written, I believe, in 1903 um, by someone who actually traveled um, the Congo River in Africa, uh, Joseph Conrad, born in uh, what is now Russia, but he's, he's Polish, um, born in uh, Eastern Europe, traveled uh, to the United Kingdom, where he received uh, an education and then became a kind of world traveler, sailing to the South Pacific and also uh, in Africa. He wrote Heart of Darkness, and it's a really good primary source about, you know, it's a fictional story, um, but it trade it talks about the travels of one man uh, up the Congo River searching for this fictional or this real character, Kurtz. Uh, just a fantastic uh, book. And right towards the end, the famous line from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is, the horror, the horror. And uh, scholars have debated for a long time what Conrad meant by this. Um, but ultimately it's about, you know, what Africa and what the, the scramble for Africa and the riches and, and the exploitation of Native people did um, to Europeans and did to kind of the European mindset. And it's a really fantastic book if you're interested in reading more about how you know horrific the exploitation of Africa was. And I really moved through this quite quickly, so I want to come back to it. Otto von Bismarck, who's responsible for the unification of Germany in 1871, calls a conference of the major powers of Europe uh, between 1884 and 1885, known as the Berlin Conference. And in Berlin, uh, the major powers, so Great Britain, France, um, Germany, uh, even Italy, uh, Portugal, uh, the Dutch, they all agree that they're not going to fight in Africa over territories, right? The, the fear was that these rivalries that have been growing in, in Europe, especially since uh, the unification of Germany in 1871, that these are going to spill over into a global conflict in Africa, right? The, the English would battle the French, would battle the Dutch, would battle the Germans, and all this fighting would happen over land and people and resources in Africa. But in Berlin, the major powers agree uh, to not do that, right? They were going to carve up Africa peacefully. And as you can see from this map, you know, carving up is not an exaggeration. Almost the entirety uh, of the African continent was colonized by a European power uh, until 1914, when a lot of these, at the end of, the, um, sorry, 1918, uh, at the end of the First World War, when a lot of these uh, barriers come down. But look at the large portions of, of red uh, that were controlled by the French, uh, the large portions of green that were controlled uh, by the English. You see the Germans in there, the Belgians with that large Congo River, 
on the Belgian Congo there uh, next to the French Congo. So you can just see that this entire region of Africa was partitioned between uh, the powers of Europe. And this is why it was called the Scramble for Africa, um, because the Europeans, like I said, conquered the entirety uh, of the continent during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, the textbook does talk a little bit about this, so I definitely want to make a reference to it, although most of my emphasis really is on the colonization of, of um, Asia and, and Africa. There were some positives that went along, if you can think of it like that. I think positive is a bit too strong. Um, there were some less detrimental uh, aspects to colonization as well. Um, Europeans brought with them uh, their education system uh, to different places they went, particularly in China and some parts of India. Um, Europeans brought with them an education system that gave a very small, select few uh, members of the indigenous societies of China and of India access um, to larger positions in the British Empire. Uh, there are some uh, native Indians who become um, pretty important figures in uh, colonial rule in India, and the same thing can be said of China, but I want to emphasize how limited this was. Uh, for the most part, the British were good at extending education to only the most elite of the places um, that they conquered. And this really didn't extend to Africa at all, with the exception maybe of South Africa, but not even there. Um, in India and in China, the elite of, of China and Southeast Asia, and what's Indochina, Vietnam, some of the elite there were incorporated to colonial society. Uh, so there was a meshing of European and, and native um, either Southeast Asian or uh, Chinese uh, society. However, it's incredibly limited. Uh, the boys you see pictured here, of course, are all men. Uh, they're all from the elite class. Uh, and so the Europeans did bring them with an education, but the people who could get it, it was uh, incredibly limited. And then I want to bring you back uh, to our statues debate, because I really had to wrap through this quickly and just kind of tell you what I'm looking for. Um, so your response this week counts as both your uh, weekly response and your primary source discussion. Statues are primary sources. Um, for example, a lot of the Confederate monuments, as you see, uh, depicted the one in Richmond, Robert E. Lee, uh, Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy. Uh, these statues weren't erected during the Civil War, of course. They were, were erected much afterwards. Um, you know, a lot of nations don't have uh, statues to people who lost the war, but the United States does for the time being, although who knows how long that uh, is lasting. And then on the left, you have a statue of Leopold II, um, which stands in Belgium today. And so there's actually a very similar uh, moment occurring where these statues that have stood for long, um, well, some of them for long, some of them for not that long, uh, periods of time are, are starting to be uh, reconsidered, I'll say this. You can probably guess how I feel about this. Uh, people who think that it's destroying history don't necessarily recognize that the beginning of the American Revolution was the first thing that happens in New York. They tear down a statue of George III. They cut off his nose and mutilate his face, turning the rest of the statue into ammunition that they used during the American Revolution. Americans have always torn down statues. It's not an erasing of history, at least in my opinion. Um, but I'm interested to see how you can kind of connect these two very different global moments uh, into one similar thread. So um, the first thing I'm looking for is a response to three questions, a paragraph for each uh, that I've got posed to you. And then I want you to read through some of your classmates and provide a response, at least one response, to another classmate. It can be an agreement, it can be a polite disagreement, it can be somewhere in between about their sentiments, specifically about the third part of the question is, you know, what do you make of all of this? You know, should statues of Leopold II uh, come down? Should statues of Robert E. Lee come down? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Why? Uh, I'm really interested in your opinion. Of course, it has to be an informed opinion. We've got uh, two lectures, two and a half lectures, if you count some of this one. We've got two and a half lectures. We've got an entire textbook chapter of reading. Um, there's a lot really to be said here, but they are interconnected. You know, what do you make of this global colonization process that happened in the 19th, 20th century? Something that Robert Lee, E. Lee is not related to at all, right? Uh, a statue of Robert E. Lee has nothing to do, I guess, with the colonization of the Belgian Congo. But you can see a little bit of a common thread here, especially if you read someone like Kipling's The White Man's Burden. How was Robert E. Lee part of, or the memory of Robert E. Lee, intimately connected uh, with the memory of Leopold II, even though I guess they have nothing to do with each other, at least per se. So this will be a fun little uh, experiment here, looking for some great opinions from you, looking to you uh, to dialogue with one another in the class. And like I said, there's no right or wrong opinion here. Uh, it's really about how you argue it. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, those of you who have disagreed with me in the past, you notice agreeing or disagreeing with me has nothing to do with the 
with what your score is. It's how well you argue it, how well you write is what I'm interested in. Just to quickly recap now, because I've gone into this third lecture, how was colonialism different in the 19th, 20th centuries than the colonialism that took place in the Americas? Well, one thing is that it didn't take place in the same area, right? Uh, the second wave of colonization happened in Southeast Asia and happened in Africa. Another big difference about it is it was almost entirely for uh, the production of raw materials and industrialization. When you think about the colonization of the Americas, sure, Spain wasn't interested in moving populations to the New World, but the French and the English were. Uh, the Dutch, to a lesser extent, were. Uh, the reasons for colonization in the 19th and 20th century are much different than the reasons for the colonization beginning in 1492. How were they similar? Well, in the way that um, uh, the treatment of Native people happened is one very big similarity. Uh, think about the way in which Native Americans in the New World were subjugated because they were seen as uh, inferior to Europeans. Well, the same thing's going to happen in Southeast Asia and Africa, but it's also different, right? Uh, in the 19th and 20th century, there's no slave trade in the way that there was during the colonization of the Americas. But um, Native African people, Native Southeast Asian people are not seen as equal to the uh, white Europeans, not because of kind of cultural differences, but because of perceived scientific differences. Uh, and that's a really important difference, but also similarity, uh, if you can see what I'm saying there. Lecture number two, we talked a bit about the scramble for Africa, right? This period that was really came to a came to fruition to its to its head during the um, Berlin Conference of 1884-85, where the entire continent of Africa was divided between the major powers uh, of Europe. This colonization was much different than Southeast Asia because it was an agreed upon moment where the nations met in Berlin. They said, all right, you take this, I take this, we'll take this. And that's how it happened. You know, this wasn't fought out on the battlefield. It wasn't who got there first. Uh, this was an agreed upon decision to carve up Africa that happened uh, at Berlin. Also, um, the Europeans were interested in much different um, uh, raw materials. Southeast Asia was really about the markets, but in Africa it was about getting these raw materials from Africa back to Europe in order to um, keep industrialization going. And then the Belgian Congo we, we talked a lot about, right? This is really our first example of the exploitation of Africa and really the prime example that begins uh, the scramble for Africa. I appreciate your attention to these now, what's become close to three lectures. I look forward to reading your uh, responses to this week's question about historical memory and about statues, the United States, and the global world, colonization. Um, should be lots of fun. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. Looking forward to get back into the swing and wrapping up the semester in the second half. Bye-bye.